Good afternoon, my name is Jeanette Camping, Conference Manager at Henry Stewart Conference Studies. I'd like to welcome you to the latest in our series of continuing education webinars with today's topic, Student Accommodation. At the end of the presentation we will take questions, so please feel free to send them through via the chat bar and our presenters will answer as many as possible in the time available. After today's session you will receive a link to the recording of the webinar. It's my great pleasure to welcome our presenters, Paul Leamy, Alistair Watson and Eamon Cannon from Taylor Wessing. Thank you for joining us today, Eamon. Hello everybody, uh, I'm Eamon Cannon, I'm here with Paul Leamy and Alistair Watson. Uh, the topic of today is student accommodation. For most of us, I suspect, it's a uh, complex uh, investment sector. For some people it's just hotels for kids. What I'm going to try and do first of all is uh, just set out the background to all of this and I'm going to try and analyze the market in general terms. Uh, forgive me for putting it this way, but for some of you what I'm about to say is going to be stating the bleeding obvious, but uh, we need to set the background. The student accommodation sector is part of the alternative sector. Uh, the alternative sector currently is uh, about 11 billion pounds but it's uh, predicted to rise by 2019 to about 20 billion. Uh, this surge is partly attributable to alternatives becoming more acceptable to institutional investors. PBSA is likely to be the strongest performer within this. Uh, the stability and performance of PBSA uh, is, rep represents really the, uh, the demand uh, of the student accommodation sector as an asset class in its own right. The fact is that investors are attracted to a sector where there is a demonstrable undersupply uh, and the attraction of student accommodation has been driven by the story of structural undersupply and rental growth every year throughout the economic downturn. Our view is that the structural undersupply will remain in all key university markets and this will ensure positive rental growth uh, remaining as a defining characteristic. 2014-2015, uh, uh, is seeing increased rental growth, it's seeing sharpening yields and improved investment performance for existing funds. In London, rental growth is up about 2% from previous academic year. Uh, the re in the regions, the rental growth average is something less than that, but across the UK, the estimate is that the blended rental growth is about 1.75% up to September 2014. The sector has been driven in some respects by the fact that universities are now willing to provide long-term contractual guarantees on student accommodation. Uh, well, that is right, they, they, they are, and the, this is seen in the form of, of a lease, which is perceived to give three principal benefits to the uh, universities. First of all, they can get student accommodation for their own design and specification without having to directly fund their own construction. Secondly, they can attract their own students with rents fixed at very low levels. And thirdly, and I think crucially, they're able to exercise an option, uh, the expiry of the lease, to acquire the freehold interest of the accommodation. Now, universities have been able to drive very good deals because they'll pay handsomely for such leases. Institutions are attracted by the arrangement largely because of the security of the income flow underpinned by the strong covenant of the university. Uh, legal in general have become the market leaders in these income strip deals uh, and we've recently done uh, a deal in Greenwich on exactly those terms. So for the future of that, where will that go? Uh, we think that universities will take advantage of the benefits offered by these income strip deals. Uh, the, the trouble about that is that the income strip deals themselves are driven by the juxtaposition of low bond rates with the institutional appetite for long-term income streams underpinned by a strong covenant. Bond rates are now drifting upwards and I suspect as a consequence this sort of deal will lose its, uh, will lose its interest. Uh, another aspect we need to look at is the increasing competition between land 
uh, between student accommodation and residential. Residential values are significantly higher than student accommodation. Uh, it's a curious thing. There are, there are, for example, parts of Cambridge uh, where the increase in PBSA has led to the f to to a reduction in the HMO rentals, with the consequence that owner occupiers are acquiring those properties, uh, increasing the the value of them by doing them up and uh, generally looking after them. And the consequence is that oddly, uh, the increase in PBSA has led to a lessening of the of the pressure on producing further household accommodation because it's being freed up. The fact is, though, that uh, this sector has demonstrated that given a choice, students elect to pay significantly more for PBSA accommodation than HMO stock, principally because it's, it's, it's developed purposefully for them. The investors in this sector are the international banks, the UK banks, and a number of overseas C funds. Uh, we've recently had uh, the launch of REITs. We had uh, Gravis Capital Partners launched last year. Uh, they have seen significant growth since, their, since, their, since they've launched. Um, they are reporting that they have 100% uh, take up on their, on their investment properties during the current year and are predicting the same for next year. Uh, their view is that the supply and demand in and around London uh, with limited stock coming on stream uh, and uh, an increasing number of uh, students seeking places is only going to increase. We then had Empiric uh, launching uh, this year. Uh, they've had significant success and they've really grown their, their portfolio, adding Bristol and Exeter and Cardiff and recently, on top of that, they're picking up uh, a number of additional uh, properties. Uh, the, the, uh, the issue of supply is what is underpinning all of this. The, the structure under supply of student accommodation is obvious at a glance. In fact, all of the core UK markets are under supply with student accommodation. Why is this? Well, the government raised the number of student places for the current term by 30,000, so there are more freshers than ever. There were 180,000 applications in the current year than were available, and with the rise in the cap, there are about 500,000 new first-year students going to university this year, uh, and in fact, the Chancellor has indicated that the cap will be removed entirely next year, and put all that together and it's clear where the demand and the growth in demand is going to come from. Overseas students are even more uh, of an interesting case because there, there is no cap uh, and the predictions are that the number of overseas students will grow by 15 to 20 percent over the next five years. The investment itself is perceived to be an investment grade asset. It's now backed by leases that are institutionally acceptable. Uh, it reflects strong demand and it reflects the, the global reputation of the UK universities, Oxford, Cambridge, London particularly. The, there is increasing uh, competition for the prime sites, which is driving up prices. Uh, the, The student versus residential argument uh, is one that is an issue on each of the developments that you will find yourselves looking at. Uh, they will only be resolved by de the development of the longer, longer term uh, developments. the increased competition from the residential marketplace uh, is going to cause uh, further shortage in supply and greater demand and that is where the future of this in the next five or ten years, the future of this 
uh, industry sector lies. I'm now going to hand over to Alistair Watson. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much, Eamon. We're going to take some context, I think, here first. This is the planning partner here at Taylor Wessing. So doing the residential accommodation deal for students with Eamon and with Paul, who's going to speak after me. And obviously, as we're going through here, fire off the questions. We've had three or four already. Keep them coming, please. The, the context of all of this, and this is this first slide, the development hotspots. Now, because we're talking about England and Wales planning policy and law, that's why Scotland is not shown. Uh, I'm aware that, that um, there are some of, the, some of the Scottish institutions who are online listening or will be receiving this later. Certainly the commercial points that we're going to address here we think are also of relevance to you, but that's the reason why Scotland is not uh, shown. And what this illustrates with uh, thanks to our contact at Knight Frank is just how small the PBSA uh, uh, availability is, so how much room there is to grow. So that context is about the development hotspots, where around in Wales is it occurring, and how far into, the, into that demand forecast is the PBSA. The second point, which goes to need, and I thought this would be useful discussing this in the context of a meeting on a development last week. Right now in London, the GLA assumed pattern of growth for student numbers is 4.7% a year for the next five years. That is 4.7% a year from a base last year of 343,000 students in London. Let's think about UK-wide context. UK-wide, there are 163 higher ed institutions with a total of 2.5 million students and between 03 and 04 and 11 and 12, the increase over that period of time was 13.5%. So this is the context point about need, which is not going to be going away. And what we thought was it breaks down into three themes. The first one is providing for these, student, these future student numbers. They're not going to stop coming. They've got to go somewhere. As Eamon suggested, you know, the uplift in student bases this year, 30,000, there is room for them to arrive, but where they're going to stay. The second theme is really about understanding how planning authorities want to address systemic problems where they've had concentrations of student housing in certain areas in certain cities, which leads to an ebb and flow, term time and out of term time, and the social inclusivity problems that addresses, that brings about. And also leading on from that, the dispersal, how they want to make sure that they use land economically, environmentally, and socially in, in, a, in, a, in a development scenario where they will encourage developers to look beyond the core concentration areas as to where student accommodation can be provided for in the future. And the third theme is providing affordable student housing. And I'm sure that amongst all of us online here, and uh, uh, listening later, we'll be aware of the need that with the student housing purpose built, there is the need to reflect that students who are arriving are across the entire range of the economic world that we live in. So some can afford to pay higher rents, some can afford to pay lower rents. And the planning authority's view will be on need is that if there is a higher rent that is only providing a small amount of need for a large demand sector. So we are expecting the next two or three years that there'll be more focus on the provision of affordable student housing. And we'll come on to that uh, shortly. So that's about the context of need. Eamon's talked already about the asset class. Well, there are a number of factors here which are inherently planning-led, which, which we think you need to be considering. The first one is ensuring that if you take a notional 10-week term over three terms, 30 weeks a year, that is a lot of spare parts of the year that need to be filled in terms of use. The ability, the ability to use the accommodation beyond the core term time for shorter blocks of accommodation for students or for residential courses is inherently important to make the, the asset attractive. The second point is about the tiered approach, a stepped approach to ensuring that the, the availability of accommodation 
term time and out of term time is available to more than one institution. So unless we have a position where a single institution takes the long term lease, you want to have a position where if space is available within the block on a year by year basis and and the, the initial institution has taken all of its all of its all of its uh, its needs and there are spare rooms left over, they are available to other universities, to other institutions in the area who can take up the slack. And third, this is about ensuring that where you have long term institutional investors, they want socially and economically inclusive locations. So not the best parts of town, but the better parts of town. And socially inclusive means having the affordable rents that encourage social inclusivity, which encourage students of all types, overseas and UK, to be part of the accommodation block. So those are the three issues that we think go to asset class. In terms of a use, because we're talking here about new student accommodation, We've got, the, we've got a situation where we have student accommodation which has to be the main use should be sui generis. We must not forget that that, the, that, that that use class must be the dominant use class, the principal use class, the main use class that we're going to be getting consent for. But beyond that notional 30 week block time, the asset is to be sweated, but the asset which is sweated must always be the principal use of student accommodation. The shorter term, more flexible use which comes in later on must only ever be the ancillary use. It shouldn't be dominating the main student accommodation use. The next element to this is about the, the spare space that you may have in the block that can be designed in which could facilitate some leisure use, some retail use, some community use. The experience that we've had is that there is a need to build in a range of uses as part of the planning permission, as part of the planning obligation package, which reflect the fact that the university and the owner, they may well be, be both one and the same, need that ancillary space use to be flexible in accordance with what tenants might want to have, whether it is a leisure use for three or four years, perhaps the, the need for that dies away, the ability to put a new use in there, which is ancillary to the principal use. It could be a bit of retail, it could be a coffee shop, it could be a corner store type operation. You need that flexibility to be attracted to the marketplace, and so you're not bound by rigid planning controls, having to go back and get another planning permission. And so having a range of uses as an ancillary use in the block is, is we think, a very good, simple uh, device to get around that issue of, well, sweating the, the asset. So turning then to the way in which planning conditions and planning obligations will restrict and will bind how the building is, is, is used, the first point here about the needing to meet student demand, fundamentally, the planning authority is going to be granting planning permission for a building which it is being told will help meet demand in the authority's area for student accommodation. That's obviously, got, that's obviously the business case, but in return for promoting that business case in the planning sense, you will have to expect that we will be expecting that we will get a planning permission which, which is for student accommodation, certainly for that core term 30 weeks. They'll be expecting that the, the case that you're promoting will meet the student demand. The student demand point is important, leads to the second issue here, which is in many of the cities that we're all operating in, there will be more than one institution, and it is critical that the planning authority understands that having a tiered approach to, having, to being able to meet demand across a number of institutions will facilitate will facilitate accommodation for many students. It would be, certainly in our experience, it would be unwise for a planning authority to insist upon one single university or institution having access only to that block, unless it was a least type operation and unless the other institutions were, were having their demand met elsewhere. It's certainly so when we, take, when we say sustainable, it is social, environmental and economically sustainable. And these three tiers of the development system, these three tiers that the NPPF brought in, are a very useful tool to make sure that you do, in promoting your accommodation, 
get the ability to use the building beyond the core term time. It is not sustainable, it is inappropriate and it is not sustainable to have a building empty for 22 weeks of the year or 20 weeks of the year. That's not economic, it's not environmentally friendly, it's not a good use of land. It is more importantly not socially acceptable or sustainable to have accommodation blocks left empty which could be used by others beyond the core term times over the course of a year. The additional use beyond the core term time also helps in terms of the inflow of money into the local economy. And you can, you can bet your bottom dollar that when it comes to a debate with a local authority economic officer, they will support you in that, in that sense when you're pushing for, when you want to ensure that what you get is a sustainable social, environmental and economic development model which allows the use to spin out beyond the core term times. Affordable student accommodation, and we think collectively here at the firm and also with a few clients who are in the marketplace on funding, on developing and on um, uh, overseas money coming in, we do think that this will get increased attention over the course of the next one to two years. And we think that planning authorities will look to get more affordable student accommodation in, in greater numbers by a number of ways. First of all, they will encourage you to look across the Brownfield database that they have on their records to see about beyond the core area, beyond the student existing core area, where else could you possibly fit student accommodation. They might be supportive if they have a land holding there. They might want to encourage you by a central government or regional government grant to look to those lower uh, cost areas because in their minds that will allow for a lower land value for a lower rent to be introduced. If it's the case that you're able to prove that the site you're looking at is the site that one site that's available, what then will happen in our experience is you'll have a viability test scenario where the planning authority will want to understand what your business case will result in, in terms of the demand rent once it's built. They'll want to understand, is that justifiable? Is it possible to lower the rent? Is it possible to lower the rent, for example, by way of a nomination agreement with a university who may take on the block with a view to providing accommodation for its own students on a range of rents? So we must anticipate we must not be afraid or unsure about viability testing because in the same way that's required for affordable housing scenarios in the market, we think, it's our experience, that affordable student accommodation is one of the hot current topics. And the nomination agreement leads into the JV point really that, that the planning authority may want to understand what potential there is for a JV with a university, either one or two or three universities which will provide the funding backing, which might lower the costs, or that would allow for a lower specification to allow for lower rents, or the situation where, where the university may want to take some element of its own funding and provide for a lower rent to come into effect by way of putting the money in itself. And those three areas about affordable student accommodation, the ones we've come across most recently, we can imagine the next one or two years there might be some more issues, some livelier issues come to the fore there. Now the immunity uh, uh, issue, I'm sure that we've all been or know students and we know what we've all been like. The immunity impact of student accommodation is still uppermost in planning authorities' minds. They will be expecting an assessment of the impact of the operation of the use term time and out of core term time. They'll be expecting management plans about traffic, about travel, uh, about amenity space, about social activities, all of those to be introduced to protect not just the surrounding community but also the inherent community within the student block. And certainly those will be, in our experience, be put in place by planning obligation package in a section 106 agreement. But that's not to say that Section 106 agreements um, won't go to viability. The viability point, we think, now switches to SIL. And 
across England and Wales, there are a number of authorities which are advanced stages of, of having SIL schedules in place. Some of those will have schedules which apply to student accommodation, a SIL level per square meter. Others won't. It may be that in the areas where SIL does apply, you're faced with a scenario where you're buying into a site or have no choice but to pay SIL. So if there are no exemptions in place, the first stage is buying into the site is exceptional circumstances. Does that planning authority, as a charging authority, have the ability to allow exceptional circumstances relief? Because if, if relief is available, what you will then fall back to is the, the means to have to show that by post-permission viability to, to illustrate payment of the SIL will make the scheme unviable, and that's critical. Because a planning authority which has a high forecast student demand with institutions batting down the doors to demand accommodation be provided for their, for their students is more likely to be listening acutely and in the right manner to an application for exceptional circumstances relief. So if that's an argument which you can deploy, get to it very, very quickly. That's it from me for just now. I'm going to hand you over to Paul, who's uh, ready right here with me on real estate issues. Uh, thank you, Alistair, and good afternoon all. Just to introduce myself, I'm Paul Leamy, Senior Counsel in the Real Estate Team at Taylor Wessing, uh, specialising in real estate development uh, projects. Now, much of what Alistair has talked about in relation to planning policy and development constraints flows into the first of the transactional issues that I'm going to introduce in this next section of the webinar. Whilst the development of student accommodation may involve grappling with the myriad of development issues that may arise on any development project, uh, such as planning constraints, restrictive covenants, rights of light, rights of way, and other easements that may impede on the developer's proposals, there are a number of issues specific to development of this particular asset class that I want to touch on in this last section of the talk. Time constraints mean that this is very much an introduction to some of the key transactional issues faced by developers, funders and investors in student accommodation and the lessons learned from our experience advising on student accommodation projects. It's not intended to be a comprehensive review. My intention is to provide an overview of three specific issues today, although my colleagues and I will be happy to address any questions on any other issues that you may have come across in your own experiences, either via the online facility or by contacting us after this webinar. Uh, the three issues that I'm intending to look at today are planning conditions and conditional site acquisition, timing and delay, uh, and lastly, defects and the national codes of practice that apply to student accommodation. Looking first at planning conditions and conditional site acquisition, this essentially flows from the divergent planning policies adopted by the local planning authorities that Alistair has just spoken about. Planning conditions and obligations in related planning agreements are inextricably linked to the financial viability of any proposed student accommodation scheme. The decision-making processes leading up to um, a, a developer's decision whether or not to proceed with a potential development, um, a funder's decision whether or not to fund it, and an investor's decision whether or not to invest will include a detailed appraisal of the cost implications of compliance with planning conditions and obligations. But in the context of student accommodation, we're not just looking at planning obligations that require direct payments by way of planning gain. There are other conditions and obligations that could impact on financial viability. For example, the local planning authority might seek to impose the following uh, restrictions. Um, they might seek to impose an obligation to provide affordable housing or a contribution in lieu of such provision. Uh, this is linked to the planning policies that have evolved in some local areas uh, and have been the subject to much debate and challenge. Um, they might seek to restrict occupancy to a specific academic institution or type of academic institution. Uh, and thirdly, they might seek to limit the ability to rent in the tourist market outside of academic term times. Those types of restrictions can fundamentally affect the financial viability of the proposed scheme. Now, to address those potential planning constraints that may render a scheme financially unviable, 
A contract conditional on planning consent for development will usually contain a mechanism for determining whether or not a planning consent granted by the local planning authority is satisfactory to the developer. The developer will typically have a right to refuse to accept the planning consent as being satisfactory, where such planning consent or any related planning agreement contains one or more defined onerous conditions. Satisfactory, satisfactory planning consent um, could be defined as a planning permission, including any related planning agreement, which is agreed or determined to be free from onerous conditions. In the context of student accommodation, there are a number of conditions that a developer and or investor may consider to be onerous conditions. The, the negotiated list that will be set out in the site acquisition contract may include, amongst others, the following. Um, a condition that requires the construction of affordable housing within the premises, a condition that limits the occupation and or use of the premises, or substantially the whole, to students of one or more individually named educational institutions, uh, and or students involved, uh, enrolled on a degree or other higher education course for more than one academic year. Um, it may include a condition that requires the payment or expenditure of money or other payment pursuant to planning agreements and or in the reasonable and proper opinion of the buyer will or is likely to increase the total cost to the buyer of carrying out the development where such payments and costs are collectively in excess of a sum calculated by, for example, multiplying the gross internal area of the purpose-built accommodation uh, by a specified figure. Um, finally, um, the conditions uh, or list of onerous conditions uh, could include a condition that imposes a control on the rent chargeable for the units of student accommodation for which planning permission is obtained, including by way of a capping methodology and or a means or affordability test, um, which results in uh, the rentals that, that, that are available um, or, or that the, um, the investor can offer are below uh, open market value. The adoption of um, a community infrastructure uh, levy um, or SEAL charging schedule by the local planning authority, which uh, Alistair has confirmed um, and many authorities are now either have a, a, a charging schedule adopted or are in the process of doing so, uh, should also be addressed in the conditionality drafting. Where a SEAL charging schedule is in force or may come into force during the planning process, the developer will need to ensure that any onerous conditions that relate to the quantum of planning contributions, uh, such as uh, condition or the third condition that was shown on the slides, also take into account any liability for payment of seal. Pre-seal drafting um, would not um, necessarily be sufficiently wide to capture the seal because seal is not imposed pursuant to planning conditions or planning agreements. It's a separate statutory obligation. Turning to the second of the uh, three issues that I want to look at today, um, timing and delay. Meeting the demand to accommodate the new intake of students at the start of the academic year is critical and the implications of late delivery can dramatically erode a developer and or building contractor's profit. The concept of opening windows has been seen for many years in the retail sector where the retailer will typically expect a handover of a new store in sufficient time to allow it to complete its fit out for a pre-Christmas or pre-Easter store opening. However, in the context of student accommodation, there really is one opening window, the start of the academic year. Students will expect to arrange their accommodation prior to the start of the academic year and are unlikely to want to move mid-year. This opening window means there are a series of important dates in the development timeline that must be met, the most important being 1st of September, the start of the academic year. In addition, an operator will typically require some degree of certainty in the month of May of the number of beds available to let to its students in the forthcoming academic year. This will, enab uh, will enable them to start the marketing process shortly thereafter. The end of July is also an important date in the calendar, as the operator would expect practical completion of the development to occur at some point during the month of July to allow time for snagging works before the students start to arrive in September. 
a failure to complete construction so that the units of accommodation are ready for occupation at the start of the academic year could seriously impact on occupancy rates. The income that can be generated during that academic year is likely to be diminished if the developer is late in de delivering the scheme. However, as with, other, uh, as with any development, there are many factors that may impact on the construction program, uh, including, uh, for example, adverse weather conditions, uh, the insolvency of subcontractors, or unforeseen site constraints. So what happens if the construction program slips? Developers and building contracts, uh, contractors will all be familiar with the concept of liquidated and ascertained damages, LADs, becoming due if the contractor fails to complete the works by a date specified in the building contract. In this event, subject to any extensions of time and satisfying any preconditions under the building contract, a predetermined level of damages usually becomes due to the employer at a fixed rate for each day or week until the contractor completes the works. The amount of those LADs should represent a genuine pre-estimate of the likely losses an employer will suffer in the event the works are not completed by the contractual completion date. If the sum has no relation to the loss that could conceivably be incurred by the, by the employer, the courts could, however, decide that the LAD clause is a penalty and unenforceable. There's a series of well-established principles applied by the courts to determine whether or not the LADs are in fact a penalty. It is therefore vital that an employer is able to demonstrate how the LADs figure was calculated. So where does this leave us in the context of student accommodation? What will be a genuine pre-estimate of losses where the critical date, 1 September, is not met? These may extend far beyond the losses flowing from delay in the construction of other assets such as office buildings. An investor, or um, where the accommodation is pre-let, an academic institution, is likely to require the impact of the delay on occupancy rates uh, and, the, and, and its income to be reflected in the contractual compensation that it receives in the event of such delay. The developer, in turn, would seek to pass that liability down to its building contractor. The likely losses in respect of which LADs may therefore be sought uh, include um, things such as uh, the costs of providing suitable alternative accommodation for each contracted student, the costs of relocating contracted students to the completed development after practical completion has occurred, um, and the costs of potential loss of business due to cancelled tenancy arrangements and rooms remaining empty. The key difference, I think, here in relation to losses suffered in the context of student accommodation is that those losses may extend well beyond the date of practical completion. If student accommodation cannot be marketed and let before the start of the academic year, or tenancy agreements are cancelled, the rooms may remain un unoccupied for the entire academic year, with loss of income extending well beyond the date of practical completion. Accordingly, student, uh, student accommodation LADs are much more complex and potentially more substantial than those expected on a usual construction project. All parties will need to carefully consider the impact of that potential liability when assessing the financial viability of a proposed scheme. The final transactional issue that I'm going to consider today uh, relates to the period post-practical completion uh, and the obligations to remedy any defects that arise in respect of the works. There is usually a defects liability period uh, on any development of 12 months, during which the developer will, will remain responsible for correcting defects that arise. Academic institutions uh, and other providers of uh, student accommodation are likely to have signed up to one of three codes approved by the government that set out standards to measure the good management practice of student accommodation developments and contain complaints procedures to deal with unresolved issues. The three codes are shown on the uh, slide uh, that's up now. Uh, two of those um, uh, codes uh, are produced by the Accreditation Network UK uh, in association with Unipol, uh, and the third um, has been produced by Universities UK in, in association with Guild HE. Um, operators in the student accommodation world, such as NIDO Student Living, Pure Student Living and Victoria Halls, have all signed up to the uh, UNAC, uh, Unipol National Code of Standards. 
looking at that code, um, it sets out minimum performance standards for maintenance activities and repairs. And those can impact on the, um, the, the, the requirements um, that the developer will be under uh, in respect of remedy of defects during the 12-month defect liability period. The standards include priorita uh, prioritization and response times uh, that are shown on the following uh, slide. You'll note that the repairs falling in, uh, within priority one uh, require an almost immediate response uh, following uh, receipt of um, a, a, a notification of the uh, repair required. Now those performance standards will invariably be passed down to the developer in any development agreement uh, during the defects liability period. Uh, and the developer will in turn seek to uh, pass those um, obligations down to the building contractor uh, who, would, uh, who will be expected to respond and, and remedy the defects uh, within the stipulated timeframes. The key difference here is that as opposed to the usual JCT contract position um, where the contractor will be obliged to remedy any defects arising within a reasonable time of notification, um, the code performance standards will require a, a, a much more uh, um, expedient uh, response uh, following receipt of notification. This then has a further impact uh, on all parties involved and the contractual arrangements between the various participants uh, will need to be carefully drafted to provide an effective reporting and response mechanism uh, that can manage the response times required by the code. Um, now those three issues are um, just a few of the issues facing all stakeholders involved in the delivery of purpose-built student accommodation. There are many others which we um, don't have time to, to, to look at today. Um, just to wrap up, I'm now going to hand back to Eamon, uh, who is going to uh, end the session with some concluding thoughts. Thank you, Paul, and uh, thank you very much, Alistair. Uh, I guess all of that leaves us with some food for thought. We've taken you through the uh, ramifications of procuring planning permission and delivering a student accommodation development and uh, hopefully it will have led to a number of, of questions and we're now going to move from the first part of the webinar to a question and answer session. Thanks very much Eamon. I'm going to take the uh, chair. We've had a number of questions. We've picked out three. Uh, partly because they, um, they've been raised anonymously, but, but one's from a funder, one's from an investor, and one is from a university, probably in the northeast, which you might have heard by my accent, that's where I'm from originally, so if it is where I'm thinking of, um, I hope everyone's very well up there in uh, Newcastle. I think the, the first uh, question, I think, is for you, Eamon, from a funder, what do you see being the biggest challenge for student accommodation development over the next 12 to 24 months? Uh, from a funder's point of view, I'm not at all sure that there are any great challenges. What, what's the, what does it look like out there? We've got seemingly an increased demand. Student population is rising. If the Chancellor is to be believed, the cap will come off UK students in the coming year. And so there is going to be no problem from the demand point of view. I actually think that the challenges do not lie in the eye of a funder at all. I think the challenges lie in the eye of a developer. Uh, a developer is going to find himself uh, competing for land, for development land, with the increasing value of residential development. And I think that that's where the challenge is going to come from. I think we're going to find uh, a, a diminishing availability of student accommodation sites because they're going to be competing with, resi with residential developments. Paul, you got a take on that? Yeah, I, I think I'd agree with Eamon that the, the, the growth in the private rent, uh, rented sector, the PRS schemes, uh, as an asset class in its own right, um, is driving up land values. Um, just recently, um, last week, we, we, we've seen a, a report that the long-muted plans for uh, a £75 million student accommodation skyscraper next to the Shard in London have been scrapped in favour of luxury flats. Um, and, and this is effectively driven by, by the land values involved. Um, the values for student accommodation uh, in Southwark um, are, are estimated to reach uh, £900 uh, per square foot. Uh, 
um, but compare this with an estimated uh, £1,500 per uh, square foot uh, for private flats. Alistair, do you see any challenges coming forward from the planning uh, evolution? How is planning going to impact in the next 12 or 24 months uh, on the availability of student accommodation? Okay, crikey. I've only got probably one or two minutes, so I'll nail one point initially and then possibly one or two others. I, I think there is going to be, the, the single biggest focus is going to be on affordable student accommodation. What does it look like? What is it? Does that mean that funders won't step forward to um, provide funding for affordable student accommodation? Um, in the industry, um, and there are many of us who are listening in who will listen to this later, in the industry we all feel very good about rising values, but that ignores the effect occasionally about the, the way in which actually how will people pay for this, how will people get the, the loans to pay for the rent, and I think it is, it's just almost inevitable that planning authorities, once two or three of them establish a proper policy framework for imposing affordable student accommodation, that will soon feed out into the wider system, and I think we will see in the next two years, certainly, a much more polished uh, uh, industry-wide approach from planning authorities to a requirement for student housing, which will also include an element of affordable student uh, housing. That's my take on it. I've got two more questions, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to nail those uh, uh, next. Um, this one is from an investor. Uh, Eamon, do you see the student accommodation sector becoming oversaturated in terms of investment and development opportunities? Uh, well, there are more and more entrants into it, and bizarrely, one is seeing some rather uh, strange overseas investments. There are, there are funds uh, which are mostly based offshore, uh, outside the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom regulatory system, and uh, what makes them uh, notable is the rather shocking layers of fees that they charge, um, and they have been the, described as vehicles, really, for charging very elegant fee harvest, harvesting systems. Uh, and you see that in an over, that sort of thing. You see in an overheated marketplace. Uh, there, there are other examples um, of uh, rather weird and wonderful investment strategies where the investors are being sought in the in the uh, retail marketplace, with individuals being asked to invest into funds. And I, I've seen one recently where the developer. It's a fractional ownership concept where you actually get an interest in a room. Do you remember the, uh, the, the hotel room yeah. sale arrangements? It was that sort of arrangement. But broadly, uh, for as long as there is a, such a strong supply, uh, I actually think that you're going to have a very strong investment sector for the foreseeable future. And I actually believe that as the, as the sector matures, uh, and, and I suspect it's going to move from the alternative sector into a sector all of its own. So I actually do see it's going to be strong for the next, certainly for the next five years. Thank you very much, Eamon. We've got one more question time for before we wrap things up. The, the third question, and this is from uh, the, the uh, institution, I think, in, in, uh, in Newcastle, certainly the northeast. Uh, as the number of foreign students increases, do you think proximity to transport links will become more important in future student accommodation development? Um, I think I might tweak that question to remove students, foreign students, and just say as the number of students increases. I don't know if you want to start, if you have a thought on that, Paul. I know I've got one or two thoughts, certainly. Uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think as the number of students increases, um, uh, and and also the transport links that can can take those students to the locations of the relevant academic institutions, um, I think we're certainly going to see a spread out of the um, of, of the potential development sites that that could be used for um, purpose-built student accommodation. Um, the reason why um, students um, want to want to be in London, for example, is because they can get to and from the 
leave the academic institution um, relatively quickly. Um, as transport links improve, um, certainly we might might see a, a more sort of widespread um, uh, of, of those um, new build developments um, uh, coming on stream. Yeah, I think that I think that's right. And the uh, reason why I thought we'll actually take out foreign students and just say, as the number of students in, increases planning authorities will view the spread of transport infrastructure, whether it's Manchester or Birmingham or Newcastle or Leeds uh, or, or Bath or Bristol and, and London, take Crossroad as, as an example, planning authorities will view that as part of the dispersal scenario which allows more planning authorities to make available more sites at a lower land value, at least initially until the rush starts. So if you look at Maidenhead, possibly, or a site out in Essex, which would be along the HS2, along the Crossrail route, you can imagine scenarios where planning authorities centrally will be saying, listen, speak to the guys in Essex, speak to the guys in Berkshire who have sites available near to the new Crossrail uh, stations, which will bring students into London very quickly. And that's that. So I've been uh, reminded we have... Uh, we've got one more slide. Oh, three good-looking chaps. I don't know who they are. They have our contact details up there. We'll be very happy, very welcome to pick up any questions that you may want to fire over to us. The email addresses are there at the bottom of the details. And then we also have, as a reminder, we would be delighted if you join us next year, 2015. We have two more webinars lined up. Uh, the first one, JV, on real estate is in February. The second one is high-end ready real estate in, in uh, March. You'll see there that you can register with the Henry Stewart Conferences facilities. They've been very kind of supporting us today, so thank you very much to Helen and Jeanette. Uh, from all of us here at Taylor Wessing, from me and Eamon and Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. I think I can be the first to wish everyone a very Merry Christmas because we're almost at the end of November and we'll see you next year. Thanks ever so much.